Uh, good afternoon, <laughs> sorry everyone. Sorry, <laughs> so I guess I don't have an excuse of our jet lag to say good morning, but. Okay, so uh, welcome to the uh, ICTP uh, SAFER and uh, IFT UNESP uh, colloquium. Um, usually when we have an activity here, workshops or schools, we uh, ask one of the prominent lecturers or speakers to give a colloquium to the whole uh, IFT community, meaning grad students and uh, people working in other, in other fields. So today we're um, very happy to have the uh, one and only Ricardo Ratazzi, and who is visiting us this week. So you know when a person is very famous, when they have a Wikipedia page? So I got uh, some info. Uh, Wikipedia that Wikipedia page. was done by a friend I discovered. <laughs> so, so that's the only reason I have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> anyway, so Ricardo got his uh, PhD uh, from... Uh, never got a, I never got a PhD. It's a diploma, but yeah, we know it's yeah. a PhD. Yeah, uh, yeah. From Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa with Ricardo Barbieri. And then he had uh, postdoc positions at Berkeley, Rutgers, and CERN. And uh, in 1998, he, was a per he became a permanent researcher at the Instituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare in Pisa. And from 2001 to 2006, he was a junior staff at uh, CERN. And since 2006, he's a professor at uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. So Ricardo has done uh, seminal works in different areas. He's one of the broadest physicists I know. And uh, I remember the uh, strongly interacting Light Higgs, that was a very influential paper, um, and other, you know, I can count many, many papers that uh, he has done, and which were very important in all fields. So today he's going to talk about multi-legs, superfluids, and semi-classic. Okay, thank you very much for this very generous introduction. Uh, okay, I'm here to give the colloquium. Of course, I'm a replacement of the great Nima. It's not the first time I do this, okay, I'm now, I'm going to do this as a business. It doesn't show up and then I have to. <laughs> it's okay. So I, uh, it's not that I didn't have time. So I, 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 I was traveling in the meanwhile. And in the end, I decided to give a colloquium on this, which is what I'm working on right now. And I extend a little bit the existing talk to try to make it palatable to a bigger audience. Let's see if I succeeded. Um, before starting, I should say something. Um, so this is work that I um, done with my collaborator, Alexander Moni in Lausanne, and my two students, Gilles Badel and Gabriel Cuomo. And there have been, in the last few weeks, other three papers that uh, are, are on related area, um, in particular one with by Komargotsky, Tizzano, and Grassi. Grassi, Komargotsky, Tizzano, who went, I mean, who has, a good part of the vision I'm going to give you. The other papers have only partial, uh, uh, but, but the paper by Komargotsky is the domain of supersymmetry. The, the physics is a bit different, okay? But the ideas are similar. So, uh, as you see from the title, uh, legs, superfluids, many legs, semi-classics, okay? So let me try to start with a broad introduction. So there's no doubt starting from student on, that all physicists have in their heart the idea that quantum mechanics is astonishing. It's an astonishing fact of life and of nature. And now this fact that it was within, between us, between ourselves, has gone public, okay? Uh, <laughs> perhaps not in an optimal way, okay? Now everybody knows that we don't understand quantum mechanics. Even worse, we don't want to understand it. In fact, we don't even know what, how to derive the S matrix, as we have seen, okay? Uh, anyway, if you really want, to, okay, you can read this paper, you can read this article, uh, okay, I said, you can read it, get your opinion, but if you really want to see it shine, you should read Lubos Motel reaction on his blog. <laughs> okay. then, then it's truly valorized, this, this, this paper is really, so you have to read both, okay? They are like a dual pair, it's like two, Two characters in Dante's Inferno inside, so you, you need both of them together. <laughs> so, in fact, we say quantum mechanics is astonishing, but actually, I would think that what you should think is that classical physics is astonishing. And the, the fact that quantum mechanics very easily hides in a huge, vast array of physical situation behind classical physics. Okay. Of course, there are two aspects of this disappearance of 
quantum world behind classical physics all have to do with systems or situations where you have some level of complexity or macroscopicity, okay? One is the coherence, okay? The macroscopic uh, superpo or quantum superpositions are unstable to the coherence in, in sufficiently complex environments. And, uh, and the other is the arising, the emergence of trajectories, okay? Now, situations in which you can uh, safely talk, I mean, with a good approximation of trajectories. And this is more connected to what I'm gonna talk about, okay? So let me, let me explain this, okay? So we know a crucial perspective on the occurrence of trajectories, which is the essence of classical physics, is offered by the path integral, okay? Path integral states that in order to find the probability amplitude to go from qi at ti to qf at tf, you have to sum over all histories, okay? And the weight uh, of each trajectory is given by this uh, exponential, the exponential of the action, of the classical action for that trajectory divided by h bar with an i. Uh, so that's a weird integral. Luckily, there are, I hope there are no mathematicians in this room, okay? Uh, because it's not fully well defined. We define it by analytic continuation from Euclidean. I mean, it's not an easy beast, okay? But anyway, that's the way it's defined. And we are physicists, okay? And how does the classical regime, I mean, we, we have a, an integral, and when we have an integral of the form e to the i exponential of something, we know from uh, the, uh, the derivation, say, of the Stirling formula in analysis, that in the limit in which some parameter is large, in this case, one over h is large, or whatever in s over h is large, I mean, sufficient range in, in there, there can exist ranges of parameters where you can compute this integral systematically as a saddle point expansion around the stationary trajectory, some leading stationary trajectory, okay? And uh, so those situations where this series expansion, say, converges, okay, that the saddle point dominates the first correction and so on and so on, very much like in Stirling formula. You can see the approximation of n factorial by Stirling formula and the subsiding effect are precisely like loops in, uh, in quantum physics, okay? They're exactly the same idea. So then you have the, the leading, the one loop, the two loop, and so on and so forth, okay? So the classical regime is the case in which uh, this series is convergent, so you're dominated by the first term. And normally, this corresponds to a situation where the action itself is large. Uh, it should be clarified a little bit. There are two notions which uh, you encounter in physics. One is, is the notion of classicality, and the other is the notion of weak versus strong coupling. I will get back to that in a moment. Before doing that, given that this is a colloquium, let me fancy a little bit. Just fancy. It's a colloquium, right? So we can fancy a little bit. Let me fancy if Lagrange could have fancied all this, okay? Uh, well, here by Lagrange, I mean all the saviors Lagrange, uh, Hamilton, who formalized Newtonian mechanics in Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics and others, okay, Mupertuis, I mean, bunch of illuminated people from the 18th century, okay? So classical mechanics states that uh, the trajectory satisfying Newton's equations, the equations of mechanics, correspond to stationary points of a functional called the action, okay? which is something written in terms of uh, the, your dynamical variables and written as an integral over time. So there's notion of locality in time. It's the sum of contribution at each different time. There's no contribution coming from two different times together multiplied. It's, it's what we call local in time. It's an integral over time. And, uh, and uh, well, this is remarkable, I would think. I think it's remarkable and mysterious. Mysterious, I think Lagrange could have thought, and maybe he did think, and I, I should worry perhaps now that I get old to study the old papers. By the way, Lagrange is the first one who wrote a Lagrangian for fluids, which is something that when I derived, I say, oh, that's great, that Lagrange had done it 200 years before. So there are lots of things. Maybe he did other things, could have done it. Maybe he was shy, he was afraid, it was, there was the French Revolution, maybe he was afraid he would cut his head. So, uh, I mean, you could have asked, where is the necessity of a full-fledged functional? You have a, all these 
functional, which is like a function, okay? It has a lot of structure. And then you just take the stationary points. I mean, you have all these ubertas, all this richness, okay? It's like the Amazon, okay? And what do you get? You get just some little piece of it, okay? And uh, you may as well have thought, I mean, for instance, ju just to give you an idea, uh, so you could have thought, uh, why not all the other points also matter, okay? So, if, so for instance, just to give you an, an appreciation of this, you, you have all this action functional, but for instance, this normalization doesn't matter. If you multiply the action by two, by three, by four, by 10 to the 80, uh, the equations of motions are the same, okay? You multiply a function by a constant, the stationary points are the same, okay? So, but Lagrange could have said, no, but I like this functional, I want to promote it. Uh, I want to promote it to a point that, to, to, to such an extent that all points matter, not just the stationary ones. Well, in that case, uh, what you should have done, necessarily, you would have needed to have a unit of measure of action to compare the action of different points, okay? Because now, it's not just the stationary points that matter, it's the value of the action that matters. And then, you would have added this unit of measure. You would have called it probably L, not H, okay? And, uh, and then there would have been two regimes, the regime where the action is bigger than L and the regime where action is less than L. And then you would have to figure out how to differentiate these two regimes. And with the benefit of hindsight, I think you could have a story where it could have gotten two path integrals. I think so. Well, you can make it. He knew Stirling formula. He knew, he knew, he knew well, no, Stirling was not born yet. He could have derived it. I mean, he was a smart guy, okay? So anyway, let me get, let me stop with this. Let me get back on track, okay? Uh, uh, as I said, weak versus strong and classical versus quantum. So uh, weak and strong and classical and quantum are two important features of what I'm gonna talk about. So let me characterize them in a bit of a rough way. And then you, you can also uh, make distinction further down with respect to what I will say, but that's as a zeroth order statement, I think this is useful. Okay, so first of all, we can characterize path integrals based on, in two broad classes, those that you can call them weakly coupled or strongly coupled, okay? And uh, whether you are weakly coupled or strongly coupled depends both on the action, that is to say on the dynamics. Well, now here I, I wrote, it's an old formula, forget it, okay? Just go back, I mean, I forgot to change it. Uh, this is already Euclidean action, that's okay. So the, what we, what the regime where we are, whether weak or strong, and I will define them what they are, uh, although most people here know, but let me, this is a colloquium, so I, 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 I can go being apologetic all the time by saying obvious things. Uh, weak and strong, they are, they are uh, whether you're weak or strong depends not only on the dynamics in principle, but also on the boundary conditions, okay? Okay, and let me define what weak and strong means. Well, weak simply means that uh, the, the path integral, can be performed as a systematic saddle point expansion, uh, like a systematic expansion around the saddle point, okay? In other words, the loop expansion, there exists a saddle point, you want to compute something, and you do have to do this path integral, and then somebody says, look, this path integral is dominated by a saddle point, and around that saddle point, uh, the loop series converges, okay? So then one loop is smaller than two loops, and so forth, and then this is, definition of weak coupling, okay? You can compute it in further approximation, and there's gonna be a loop count counting parameter that is the coupling, okay? Uh, on the other hand, you can have a situation which is strong coupling, where the path integral cannot be described by a leading trajectory. It's like an ordinary integral that is not dominated by a saddle point. In other words, this integral is dominated by all possible configurations, very broad, it's a mess, okay? There's no, there's no configuration that dominates uh, the integral. And, uh, and the, the, this, this, the fact that there's no dominant configuration can be viewed pictorial by the fact that quantum fluctuations are large. Uh, all points, uh, you can fluctuate, you jiggle from one point to another, okay? So. Now, what about classical and quantum? Well, this notion arises when you consider observables, okay? Uh, and it's best seen when you consider the weakly coupled case where there is the dominant trajectory. Now, when there is a dominant trajectory, now you can start computing observables. And observables can be organized, the computation of observable can be, um, observables are functions of your dynamical variables, okay? And the expectation value of the observable is just the observable inserted in the path integral. 
And uh, so to compute this thing, you in the weekly couple case, you simply expand around the saddle point, okay? Uh, the, 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 the gamma classical corresponds to the saddle point. And then you start considering uh, quantum fluctuations in the computation of the integral, which is loops. And then there are two situations. So you can write the result of the observable as a sum of two pieces. The contribution from the purely classical trajectory and the contribution from quantum fluctuations. And then you have two possibilities. Either the classical contribution dominates the quantum or it doesn't. And this we call semi-classical, this we call quantum. So an example of this is everyday life, okay? An example of that is what we do every day, uh, quantum field theory around the vacuum. Uh, in weakly coupled quantum, weakly coupled quantum field theory, in weakly coupled quantum field theory, there is a dominant trajectory. It's the trivial trajectory. Everything is zero. All the fields, all the variables are zero. Say, in the harmonic oscillator, Q is zero. Everything is zero. I mean, just a constant trajectory at the origin in the potential. And, uh, okay, this is, a, this is certainly weakly coupled. However, in this situation, there are no interesting observables that are truly classical. I mean, uh, all observables are dominated by quantum fluctuation. For instance, the four-point function that describes scattering is like that. Okay. On the other case, when you're strongly coupled, the, the distinction between quantum and classical trajectory doesn't make sense. Everything is quantum, okay? Uh, there's a third case, actually, uh, uh, which is given by uh, systems where there is a dominant trajectory, and around this dominant trajectory, a part of the variables are fluctuating a lot, so the loop expansion controlled by these variables is not, uh, not perturbative, okay? It's not weakly coupled, but there are other variables where they fluctuate a lot less. And so what you can do, you can do first the integral in the variable that fluctuate a lot, and then derive an effective integral for only the variable that fluctuates little. In the new, in the resulting integral for the new variable, this looks weakly coupled. An example of that is given by QCD, okay? QCD, the fundamental variables, quarks, gluons, at the scale of order one GV, fluctuate like crazy, but if you, are interested in only studying the physics at much lower energies of pions, then you can get rid of the strongly fluctuating variables, and you're left with the pion variables that at low energy fluctuate very little, and then you have a weakly coupled. But that's a distinction. Now, let me get closer to the subject of my, of my colloquium, okay? And let me get to something I already said. Now, the common practice of particle physicists, uh, theorists, and experimentalists, and uh, and also some of the bootstrap guys, although they try to go beyond this, okay? So this is a non-bootstrappy thing, okay? Uh, is to the, the everyday practice, and not just because, not only by choice, it's because the standard model in many of its, uh, in, in, I mean, in, in many of its uh, phenomenological appearances is weakly coupled, okay? And, uh, and uh, so the common practice is to study few legs. So few legs in weakly coupled theory, like two to three, one to two, two to four, two to two, okay? Uh, and from the point of view of what I said so far, uh, this corresponds to small fluctuations around the trivial trajectory. So these are just small fluctuations around the vacuum. Right? You have the vacuum, okay? That's precisely what the, the LHC is a bit more, right? A plus and minus machine, you have a vacuum tunnel, and then you have E plus and minus colliding. It's a very simple two to two around the vacuum, okay? And that's our practice, okay? What I want to consider here, and the subject of this talk, is to try, the, the, the real motivation of this talk is to develop an understanding of what happens when uh, you have a large number of legs, okay? And you have a number of legs that becomes much, much larger than one. Uh, this may be interesting, for instance, uh, also in particle physics, conceptually, principle. For instance, uh, of course, it's interesting QCD, but there, uh, it, it, it's slightly different. I mean, it's interesting, certainly QCD, but it could also be interesting, uh, but in, in, uh, in, in a theory like, uh, the, in, like in the electroweak sector, the standard model, uh, for instance, uh, in future colliders, uh, 100 years from now, we'll get to 100 TV, and there we will be able to have a lot of energy and to produce uh, tens or even hundreds of Higgs's and W's. And the question is, are we sure that we understand what's going on? 
And uh, of course, we would think, oh, this is very small, and that's very more, most likely true. However, to compute what happens is absolutely non-trivial. Okay? So the question is how to describe physics in this regime. And what I will discuss today is a toy, 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 toy version of this. Okay? Uh, I, will, I don't, will not give you an answer for that, but I see this as a preparation. for it. Uh, let me give you an example of this issue about multi-legs in, in a theory that resembles the standard model. They say phi to the fourth. Okay, so let me, and this, this is a subject that has been studied in the 80s and 90s quite a bit. It's a subject where there is a sort of, a, there's a bit of ethnical discrimination. If you're not Russian, you should be careful to approach this, okay? And uh, so I'm studying slowly, I'm collaborating mostly with Russians, so I'll, uh, very soon I'll be ready to, to do hopefully something useful. So there's a nice review by Valery Rubakov from the mid 90s on this, and there there are references to all bunch of authors that I'm not quoting, okay? Uh, uh, so let's consider the following computation. Imagine you have some external source, let's say phi to the fourth, an external source that injects one virtual quantum in phi to the fourth. And this virtual quantum has a lot of energy. So then there's a certain probability that this virtual quantum will split in three. There's a quartic interaction. Then can further split and split and split and split. And you can compute the amplitude for splitting up to generating n quanta, okay? And this computation can be done easily if you are near threshold, okay? In particular, if you are exactly at threshold, the amplitude is given by this formula. This has been computed first by Brown uh, in the late 80s, I believe, okay? Then if you square it and you consider phase space, okay, at threshold, phase space is zero, so it doesn't give you any effect. So if you go slightly away from, from threshold, uh, you expect that slightly away from threshold, the amplitude will not change much, and you can compute a sort of cross-section. I mean, this is more like a decay rate for this virtual, from this, for, of this virtual quantum into these other ones. Uh, and by the way, this, is, this seems very unphysical, but you can do something more physical. You can imagine this virtual quantum is just being produced in a scattering. And this is the guy that then branches. Okay, this is the guy. Okay. And what I'm saying here, it has been argued more or less well, to work in exactly the same way, even if you have uh, more well-to-do uh, reactions, okay? So what you have is that the rate uh, grows, uh, grows, I mean, the, the rate has this behavior, okay? Uh, it's the square of this, and then there's the dependence on the, on the phase space, which you can compute easily using a sort of semi-classical thing, but that's okay, you can, uh, um, subtle point. You can uh, estimate the behavior of the, um, of the um, phase space this way, okay, it goes by epsilon here is the energy, kinetic energy per quantum, okay? If you go exactly at threshold, all the quanta are at rest and epsilon is zero. Their individual kinetic energy is zero. So you see that the, the rate goes to zero. Uh, it goes exponentially in the number of particles, okay? However, there's an n factorial in front and the n factorial goes faster than an exponential. So eventually, no matter how small lambda and epsilon, if n is large enough, this wins. Okay, it wins, and mm, it wins, and uh, that means that something goes wrong because that means that some probability is becoming large. Probability cannot be larger. I mean, okay, here we are using other units, but when some cross section grows, I mean, some rate like this, you have to be careful to check whether unitarity is satisfied. And in this case, it is not. When when this this guy grows arbitrarily, you violate unitarity. So something should happen. It means. When you violate unitarity in a computation like this one, this is a three level, it means that your approximation is breaking down. It means that higher orders are becoming important to restore unitarity. And in fact, you can compute loop corrections, okay? And this has been done by Rubikov and collaborators. And you find that loop corrections themselves grow with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with, uh, with the power of n, okay? In such a way, uh, that uh, the, the, the loop expansion breaks down, okay? In fact, the loop expansion breaks down, although not clarified here, when lambda n is bigger than one, not la when lambda n square. I mean, we will get, we'll see that more easily in the case that we discussed before. In fact, what you can see, yeah, the, the question is, is this a mess? Are we hopeless? Have we lost all hope? What is the issue? Is this strong coupling? What is this? What, what does this represent? I mean, according to the picture I gave before about the various quantum situation, is this, is this mean that the, that the system is becoming strongly coupled in this regime? OK, 
okay, that you have the weakly coupled, what we call the weakly coupled standard model, the weak interactions are no longer weak at high energy. Is that the case? Uh, well, in principle, you don't know, okay? Uh, you have to compute, but it's a mess. Well, luckily, it's a mess, but not so much a mess. As it was shown by Rubikov and collaborators, the leading contribution exponentiate, okay? And the final result uh, can be written in this form, okay? Can be written as the exponential of n times a function of lambda n, okay? And these guys have, computing, have, have, have computed the leading contribution here where lambda n is finite, but not bigger than one. The, remember, the lambda n finite, when, when lambda is small, means that n can be very large, okay? So it's still interesting. It's not lambda n infinity, but it's still, so it's still a very large number of legs. So this was fine, found by these guys. Now, what can I say about this exponential? Well, this exponential shows, as in all cases I discussed before, that whenever you have a rate or an amplitude and it has an exponential behavior like this, okay, uh, this suggests that the computation of this quantity should be, in principle, performed. I mean, there should be a way to compute things by using a saddle point approximation. Is okay? it classical or quantum? Eh? Is sigma is classical? Sigma is a, is a rate, it's quantum. Okay, yes, sure, it's a rate. Okay. Uh, well, not so much because this is, you're really a threshold here, right? You're really a threshold. You're close to threshold. You're non-relativistic. You have many non-relativistic particles. It's like the formation of a condenser. There are many particles that are, uh, you could make, perhaps see it, perhaps the closure thing is more like stimulated emission, something like that. I mean, if I have to make a comparison, but these are non-relativistic. No, it's very different. It's very different than the infrared problem. Oh. Very good. You're really getting to the point. These are loops. And the loops are summing to this. So, in fact, part of what I will have to say today is what is a tree, what is tree, and what is not tree? That's not a well defined thing, or at least it's well defined as soon as you've identified the proper trajectory. In other words, these are loops. Okay, I think I see you. Uh, okay, perhaps I should. Okay, these are loops. Okay, let me tell you very quickly, and that these are loops, and then you can write it this way. This suggests that those loops are loops only around the trivial trajectory, and they should be classical effects if you find the right trajectory. Okay. But this will become, there will be more examples of that later on, so let me not further re remain on this. So this exponentiation was in fact proven, the fact that there is a semi-classical way to compute this was indeed proven by Son, uh, back in the 90s, and it was proven formally, and he, it's still a reasonable mess, and he did the first computation, and he showed that he can reproduce all these loops classically, okay? That the, that the resummation of these loops can be gained, can be obtained by, instead of doing loops around the trivial trajectory, you just do, you just find a suitable different trajectory. There you basically get all the loops, okay? Uh, in other words, in some situation, uh, expanding around the trivial trajectory, uh, there will be more and more fluctuations, and these more and more fluctuations are simply telling you that this, the real trajectory is another one, okay? Uh, the dominant one. So anyway, this was proven by Son in the, back in the 90s. It's still a reasonable mass, and in fact, there was some, some debate in recent years about the notion of explosion, still the fact that working out the detailed physics there is not obvious. Now, let me tell you, I'm not telling you here that something totally Unbelievable can happen, but because this F cannot grow because of unitarity. But it could happen that if you compute it properly, at some regime it goes to zero, which means that you have a, a rate that almost basically saturates unitarity. You, 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 you produce a large number of particles with finite probability, okay? Which is still a possibility, it's a logical possibility. Of course, you would say the most likely thing is that this function is actually negative, so that it's always negative, so that this rate will go to zero. I mean, no matter what it is, everything will go to zero. Hard to compute, but exponentially small. Okay. This is still a threshold, right? This is still 
near threshold, near absolutely. Threshold. So if you go to now, the computation that were done, no, very, very away from threshold is very difficult. And even the computation that have been done recently were always done at threshold, and then the one patches in the, the, the epsilon dependence, and that's part of the problem. Okay, one would need to do the computation with. Uh, so, this is something I, I personally would like to study better. Of course, there are more qualified people than me. In particular, the all things, all the things I'm saying, including the large chart stuff I'm going to talk about, Son was ahead of everybody by at least two decades. Okay, you should have invited him to give this talk. Okay, so but I'm here, so it's okay. So. Uh, Apparently now he's busy with other things, but uh, he no longer cares about high energy physics. So uh, anyway, in preparation for studying this properly, I want here in the remaining 25 minutes, no, 30 minutes, because I started five minutes later, uh, present a toy uh, uh, example of this, of a sim um, where a similar issue arises. This is a toy from the point of view of particle physics, but it has interesting implication from the point of view of statistical physics. Okay, so I think it's worth, it has its own uh, dignity. Okay, let me just say what I'm considering. I'm gonna consider uh, the simplest theory with a U1 uh, quantum number, okay, with a U1 symmetry, which is complex phi to the fourth, okay? And I'm gonna work in this in four and in four minus epsilon dimension. And this is how connection with statistical physics will arise, but I'm working uh, this is my theory. So you can interpret both as a quantum field theory or a statistical system. Now, we are familiar with that when lambda is small, uh, and we compute, a, compute quantities which involve few legs, like a four-point function, we have an expansion which is controlled by lambda, lambda, lambda squared, lambda cubed, and so on and so forth. It's a perturbative series. Of course, we know this is an asymptotic series, but never mind all these uh, subtleties and uh, super refinements. Uh, it converges, okay? If you want to compute this with certain accuracy, uh, I mean, depending on your experiment, your, you, let's say lambda of 4, 16 pi square is one per mil, the accuracy of your experiment is one per million, you go to two loops, okay? You go to the next order. Let's say to me, one in, one in a million is hard to achieve, but uh, one in 10 to the minus five would be achieved at, uh, at the future E plus E minus Z machines. So, okay. So now consider the case of many legs, okay? So in particular, I want to consider the simplest quantity which involves many legs, and that is the anomalous dimension of the operator phi n. Okay? You know, operators uh, at, the, at the leading order in perturbation theory have a dimension which is uh, dictated by dimensional analysis, but when you compute quantum correction, they change their scaling, okay? This is also the same phenomenon that is responsible for the running of uh, the electromagnetic coupling, that is like an anomalous dimension of f mu nu, the square, the, the, the kinetic term, the gauge kinetic term. So just standard renormalization, okay? So I want to compute this anomalous dimension. Let me, in what follows, this multi-legged field where, oh, by the way, this is a complex, okay? This phi is complex. Phi to the n is n complex phi's, okay? Uh, I will indicate it this way. So now I can start computing uh, quantum correction that will contribute to the anomalous dimension. So at one loop, I have this diagram, at two loops, I have various diagrams, including this, this, that. Uh, of course, by combinatorics, you see right away that at one loop, you have to connect n legs to a phi square phi. So you have an object here with n legs. And here you have the interaction uh, where these are the, 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 let me write, these are phi and these are phi bars. Okay, and then you have to connect two legs out of this. You have, you have to choose here, you have to choose the first choice is n, the second choice, you're only n minus one. So the multiplicity, as you see here in front is n, n minus one. And here is the same, you get three, you pick three, it's that. And then this is slightly more involved, okay. And uh, so you see that you have a similar situation that when the number of legs grows, even if lambda is small, perturbation theory eventually breaks down, and the question is to understand what happens. Uh, let me tell you right away what happens. Uh, in this situation, for instance, if you take at each loop order uh, the contribution with the highest power of n, which remains, uh, you will find that the anomalous dimension takes this form. There's an overall n. Well, this overall n is the unit of measure. This operator, to start with, had already dimension n. So n is overall, okay? There's an n overall, start with that. But then you, you see that the perturbative series 
is a series in lambda n. Okay, and this series uh, stops converging when, in particular, well, if, if, if I were to put the powers of pi, roughly, is then when the lambda n over 16 pi square is bigger than one. Actually, to tell you the truth, the fact that the result for the numerous dimension is this is not immediately obvious because at any finite loop order, there are loops with many more powers of n than this, okay? However, you can prove, at least order by order in perturbation theory, though for instance, so you, you can organize your loop series in the following way. At, uh, you can have what I call connected diagram where, there is, where, where, where all the interactions that you have are connected, okay? Uh, by, by themselves. And then there are double connected where the interactions are only connected through this, okay? And triple connected and so on and so forth. Well, what turns out is that, for instance, here, the leading contribution when n grows of this series, you see this is like the, the, the Margarita, you say the, the Margarita. Margarita, okay. Daisy, the, daisy. the daisy, the daisy with one petal, two petals, three petals, all these guys at the leading order in exponent shape, okay? And but you see, they would exponent it if this were exactly n times m and one square, but it's not exactly that because this is two and three, okay? So what is left marries these other guys and so on and so forth in such a way that all that remains is what I showed before. So the leading, uh, because, okay, exponent shape, why exponent is important? Uh, exponent is important because the number of dimensions is simply the derivative of the logarithm of the wave function normalization. So you have to look at what you have in the exponent to find the number of dimension. And the exponent, exponent trivially turns out to have this structure, okay? Uh, proving this diagrammatically is, is non-trivial, okay? I didn't bother doing it to all orders. I think it can be done. It's a combinatorics problem. Uh, but we have a much better proof, which I will give in a moment, okay? Which doesn't use diagrams. Uh, so let me comment on this result, okay? So the series can be organized as a, in the following way, okay? The number of dimension divided by n there is a contribution which is summing at each loop order the term with the highest power of n. Okay, this is p lambda n. Then there is a subdominant contribution which at each loop, at each loop order, it sums the terms which have one less power of n, or if you want, one more power of lambda. It's the same thing, and so on and so forth. This is, for those who study quantum field theory, this is very similar, fully analogous to what happens when you do the normalization group. When you study the renormalization group at one loop, uh, what you're doing, you're resumming all the terms with one coupling and one log, okay? Is the lambda log resummation. When you go to the next order, is you do two loop uh, uh, RG equations, then you sum the terms that have one log less or one lambda more, okay? That's the subdominant. This is very similar to what we have here, so it's a similar, it's a similar structure, and in fact, uh, the structure is also similar, only that here it's a little case n, and this is a large n, to the case where you have quantum field theories like large NQCD with a large number of degrees of freedom, where n is not the number of legs in my operator, but n is the number of degrees of freedom. In that case, uh, the, our expansion can be made similar to the large n expansion, simply trivially right here you have you have P0 lambda n uh, plus uh, lambda uh, P1 uh, lambda n plus lambda square P2 lambda n. And here you simply multi, uh, um, multiply by n and divide by n, multiply by n square and divide by n square. And this you can call P bar. It's a new, it's again, it's a function of n lambda. And this again is a function of of uh, n, n lambda, okay? And then it can be written in this form. And now it looks like a one over n expansion. And in the case of large n theories, this expansion can be viewed as it corresponds to a topological expansion, okay? Expansion in topology of diagrams. And uh, okay, maybe there is a similarity there as well. In fact, probably th there is, okay? I mean, you have a function of two variables. Can't I always write this do one, do one sum first and then do the other? Is it really not trivial before you have an alternative that can be two and one? Otherwise, can't I always do more than two? No, because you could have had 
more powers of n. I mean, this is what I'm saying is that, okay, once you, once there is, okay, let me say the following. About the starting power. Yeah, right? yeah I mean, I mean you, you could have had uh, more powers of n at a certain point, okay? So you re re remember, at, at loop L, you have terms that go like, at loop L, you have terms that go like, like lambda L, n to the 2L, which is much bigger powers. This all disappear and they go down to n l plus uh, n uh, l plus one. So I don't know what, whether I am. So for poly, the 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 fact that the expansion is in n lambda and not in n cube lambda or some other or that there is or that all terms just go wacky. Uh, um, it, well, as you will see, it's trivial if you look, if you look at it properly. Okay, I don't know whether I'm as answering your question. So do you have an interpretation, a graphical description of what P2 is, or you don't need to, you don't care? I have an interpretation of P2 in terms of an alternative semi-classical trajectory. I, I will show you, yeah. Uh, graphically, diagrammatically, one, one, one could think about it. Um, yes, uh, I, I know what P, P, uh, for instance, let's talk about the leading one, P0, okay? Uh, P0 is, uh, if you do things properly, is, is the leading term in the connected diagram. Th those that have the, the that all leg, like, like diagrams, like, like, like those ones. Okay, there's some, there's this notion, but you have to be more careful, yes. Uh, but again, but you see, you have to be careful, even there, because you see, if I redefine what lambda is in lambda plus constant, this spits out a linear term in lambda. So what really, I mean, the, the leading order in, uh, in, in lambda n uh, truly come from a combination of, of, all, of all classes of diagrams. It's truly non trivial recombination of different diagrams. In fact, it's semi-classical. That I think is the reason. It could not be just in a single diagram. But honestly, I, I haven't thought about this deeply enough, okay? Phi q? At any finite n, this n can be whatever you want. Or oh, this n does not have to be large here. I never use that n as large. It's only that, look, let me put it this way. Uh, when n is of order one, then all, all this structure uh, is, 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 is not useful, right? All these and these are all the same. I mean, you see what I'm saying? The higher, if n is of order one, the higher order here, and the next order there are, the, are, are equally important. You have to verify the minimalization forms a group. Look, you, you will see this, yeah, it forms a group, yes. Yes, it does. Anyway, let me, let, let, let me press on because I'm really, I'm really out of, uh, so very quickly, okay? Can one derive this exponentiation? I can one resum the lambda n series, okay? Can I do this computation concretely? Okay, there, there is this, uh, if lambda n is of order one, okay, can I do this computation or it's out of question? Is it strongly coupled that I cannot do it or simply I'm expanding around the wrong trajectory? So there are two options. Either it's weakly coupled or it's strongly coupled. What do you think? Eh? What do you think? Is it strongly coupled or weakly coupled? Weakly, weakly coupled. Good guys. Uh, good. Eh? Otherwise, otherwise I couldn't have given the talk. Okay. If it, that's, also, that's that's the answer. If it had been strongly coupled, then that's it. Okay. So, so it's already there. Shit. Okay. Oh, that's easy to answer. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let me give you the basic steps. The basic steps are this. Okay, let me take this action. Okay, here I'm trying to be pedagogical. Uh, let me use units, let me use variables that explicitate what the loop expansion parameter is, if I rescale the field. La one over lambda comes in front, and now one over lambda plays the role, lambda plays the role of h bar, so is the, is what, is the object that controls the semi-classical expansion. Okay, so lambda small gives, formally gives us hope of being able to do a semi-classical expansion. And now, when I compute the correlator, let me, by, by the way, for simplicity here, I went directly to Euclidean space, where the path integral is well defined in, even according to mathematicians, I mean, to some of them. Uh, uh, so, you compute this correlator, 
phi n bar, phi n, x final, x initial, okay, two points, okay, which I call this way precisely like, uh, like before for in and out, I mean, the particular I computed before. And now, a simple remark is that now you can bring this in the exponent, okay? And you can bring in the exponent, and now the path integral takes this form, which is very inviting, okay? This form, in fact, imagine this is just an ordinary integral, okay? So this form invites viewing this path integral in the following way. You can take lambda small, but you can enough to take lambda n fixed, okay, equal two, three, okay? This is just a finite parameter here, and as long as lambda is small, this integral can be done performing a semi-classical approximation, okay? Uh, even if n lambda is 0.1, 1, 2, 3, 10 to the minus 2, whatever, okay? So you can compute semi-classical if you want in a double limit where lambda goes to zero, becomes very small, and lambda n is fixed, okay? This is very similar to the large n coupling where you send uh, n to infinity with g square n fixed. Here, I'm like sending n to infinity, where lambda n fixed, which is means that lambda goes to zero, okay, or small. Very good. So now, now, uh, now in this, in this is in this new formulation, okay, of the of the computation, uh, the path integral is essentially a source term here. And when I look for stationary points, there will be, in principle, non-trivial stationary points, okay? Uh, and if I find them, okay, if I find the stationary point, then I can organize my integral as a semi-classical expansion. And in that case, just the same manipulation that give a uh, Sterling formula allow us to write the integral as the first, uh, the contribution of the exponent at the, at the saddle point plus the one-loop correction, plus the two-loop correction, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, uh, there is a, some care you have to take to really have it written in this form. Uh, uh, for those who are interested, the details are given in our paper. You have to take properly into account the fact that the, around the non-trivial trajectory, phi is non zero, so the U1 is spontaneously broken, so you have one zero mode, and that gives you precisely a crucial power of the coupling to really match the semi-classical ex expansion. To, to really match this form. And now once you have things written in this form, uh, and now this is an expansion in lambda of a function of, n, of lambda n, which is precisely of the form uh, I had before, okay, like here. Precisely of this form here, okay? Okay, so that's it, this is proven, okay? This is just a simple result of the fact that you can write, you can write the integral in form. You don't need to go through diagrammatics to see that this is what happens. If you view it from a diagrammatic way, it looks a little bit um, uh, miraculous, but that's, that's the reason why, okay? Anyway, to prove it, you really need this. Question. Yes. So this seems to be very general. So where is the uh, assumption of linear threshold? No, 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 no. This has nothing to do with what I was doing before. Okay. This is computing something uh, where there is an issue of a lambda n parameter that is finite. But I'm not computing, I'm computing anomalous dimension, I'm not computing amplitude. Yeah, that's, that's a different talk. I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is getting, yeah, this is getting CFTs and crap like that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Rogeri. I, 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 I have sold my, my soul to the devil, okay? okay. So, so this proves exponentiation to all orders. And the semi-classical expansion is valid for all lambda n, finite, as long as lambda is much less than one. But finite means could be 100, okay? It can be whatever you want as long as it's finite, okay? And now, this in particular is also valid for lambda n very small. So the results I get from this computation, when I now expand this in powers of lambda, and remember, this is gonna be an infinite polynomial in lambda n. If I now expand in lambda n, I should reproduce all the results of loops. And these loops have been, com been computed up to five loops. So I have a lot of space to check whether I'm full of shit or not, okay? Uh, so this must match it, and, uh, and you will see it does, okay? So now, but the main problem... Five loops not for all n. Eh? Five loops not for all n, no? For fixed n. For fixed lambda, yeah, lambda to the... Yeah, small, small for small lambda n, then it's small, yeah, it's more lambda. Uh, 
in fact, we used our results and the existing loop results. We merged them together, and we got the results that nobody had yet computed. I think there's some seven loops results. So. OK. Uh, we only found up to f uh, there's some seven loops for some specific, OK. A month ago. OK. Uh, OK, anyway, now the main problem is finding the solution. OK? You have to solve this equation. OK? And uh, now, this is a very simple equation. You could perhaps try to solve it in the, in the, on, the, on the computer. The problem is that uh, very, li very much like problems in electromagnetism, you're going to have divergences. Okay? It's like when you solve the electrostatic potential, you're going to have uh, divergences. Okay? And to regulate them, you have to go to four minus epsilon dimension, even classically, okay? even to, to solve. Uh, to... It's like when you compute the classical, uh, the, the energy, the classical energy of an electron. You, you, you have a, there's a potential that blows up. Okay? So you have to regulate it in some way. And in particular, to regulate it, you have to go to 4 minus epsilon. And in 4 minus epsilon, you're losing a crucial symmetry. You're losing scale invariance. This phi to the 4 theory in 4 minus epsilon, classically, is not scale invariant, which means that the solution you, that will exist is not even depending on scale Let's say if you take an insertion at xi and one at xf, and you take them very far away, and then you go very close to one, okay? Even when you get very close, the dependence on the radius will not be a simple power. It will be a complicated function. It's very hard to figure it out, okay? It's very hard to find the solution, okay? If you add the scaling, then it would be easier. Ah, the, the expansion in lambda n is, is Convergent, okay, it's analytic, basically, what you will see. The, 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 the expansion in lambda is an asymptotic series, like in all cases. What I meant the expansion in lambda, okay, the expansion in lambda n converges. As a finite, okay, let me say it. The expansion in lambda n as a finite radius of convergence, okay, and then you prolong it as an analytic function, okay. Like, exactly like in the renormalization group. In the renormalization group, the series of lambda n as a finite radius of convergence, where the singularities are associated to, where are the singularities in the RG associated to? Students, and our poles, okay? And uh, these are the finite, or so on, okay? Okay, uh, Landau poles, okay. Anyway, the colloquium, so I have the freedom to, to bullshit a little bit, right? Okay, so, uh, Ta, ta, ta. Anyway, it's not transformed to find a solution at, at, uh, at finite n. You can work in perturbation theory in lambda n, okay? You can find the solution in perturbation theory in lambda n for small lambda n, let's say even 0.1, whatever, and that's already information, and you can check and it works, okay? However, you cannot find it easily. You cannot find it for finite lambda n. It's a difficult matter. Now, uh, how to get out of this <clears throat> impasse? Well, as I said, if I could say that the solution scales nicely, I could probably guess its form and find it, okay? Uh, so one way out is to go to the Wilson-Fisher fixed point in four minus epsilon dimension, where the point, where, where, where the system becomes scale invariant, okay? Where the beta function vanishes, okay? At that point, the coupling is of order epsilon, okay? You can find like that, okay, this is, a, a, a conformal field theory in four minus epsilon dimension. It's interesting because if you daringly take the stunt of extrapolating it to epsilon equal one, it becomes the three dimensional uh, U1 model that describes uh, several quantum and statistical phase transition. In particular, it describes the phase transition in liquid helium. It describes the phase transition in some uh, alloy systems. Okay, there are, say, U1. It's a, it's a universal uh, critical point that you can study. And we will get to that. I mean, slowly, perhaps, but we will. So uh, now, if, when the theory is, is now, now I have to speed up a little bit. Otherwise, here I wanted to. So when the theory is at a fixed point, you can do the computation by mapping uh, your, your space to the cylinder. Okay? Here, I wanted to say something, but if I start saying something, it's going to take forever. So you can map the theory to the cylinder. It's a standard thing to do in conformal field theories. The reason why you can do that is that when you have conformal invariance, the overall scale of the metric doesn't matter. 
and the flat space metric and the metric of the cylinder are related simply by an overall rescaling that depends on position, okay? And in doing this uh, mapping, okay, operators, say an operator inserted here at the origin will map to a state inserted on the cylinder at minus infinity in time. And an operator inserted at very large radius, now the, ra the logarithm of the radius is precisely time, will correspond to an outgoing state at very far in the future, okay? And according to this correspondence that relates states to operator to state, the two-point function, okay, whose scaling controls is controlled by an anomalous dimension, by the dimension of the operator, uh, corresponds to the energy of the corresponding state. In other words, the dilatation operator and the Hamiltonian on the cylinder coincide. So to compute the dimension of the operator, which is another way of computing the anomalous dimension, uh, I just need to compute the energy of the corresponding states on the cylinder. And now here comes something useful. Uh, okay, the dilatation operator at the conformal fixed point is the Hamiltonian on the cylinder. However, if you go away from the fixed point, the Hamiltonian on the cylinder is still a symmetry because time translation invariance is a symmetry also away from the fixed point, okay? So now I'm in a situation where uh, the, 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 the object that, that matters, okay, where, uh, in other words, that where, where the corresponding charge that before did not allow, before was not conserved, now there is an additional symmetry, which is time, time translation invariance. Uh, and the existence of this symmetry gives the possibility, it does not guarantee it, but gives the possibility that the solution is stationary when you insert these two operators at very separated times, okay? So then, in this situation, you can do a simple consistent ansatz that the solution is stationary in time when the two insertions are very far separated in time, okay? And a consistent ansatz is given by this. The solution is simply given by a constant times a phase that rotate. And you should understand this very easily, okay? Uh, what is this? What is this system? Uh, this is a field that has a potential phi to the fourth, okay? It's like a salad bowl, okay? And the conserved charge is, is the angular momentum in field space, okay? So if I want to have a configuration in, uh, with finite charge, I need to set up my little ball, like in the roulette, that moves along, uh, along this, right? Like in a salad spinner, okay? So that's what it is, okay? This configuration has a finite, f finite charge, and that's precisely the charge of the operator I've inserted, okay? So, so then you can look for solutions of this type, and now it's a fact that solution of this type corresponds to a homogeneous superfluid. And you can understand that, okay? It is a system with a charge density, okay? Because the, because the field goes like phi goes e to the i, say something, some, some phase, Okay, and now the current, J0, which is phi dagger D0 phi, the, the, the zero component, okay, it's equal to the norm of the field times D0 chi, okay, I. Okay, so there's a finite charge density, which is precisely what you have in the superfluid, and the field, the transformers and the charge as an expectation value. So the charge is spontaneously broken, and that's precisely what defines the superfluid. So what we find is that this problem of computing the anomalous dimension of an operator with many lag gets mapped into the study of the property of a superfluid of that system, okay? It's as if the operator with many legs, it has so many legs, it has so much charge that when you insert it, it creates a superfluid, okay? That, that's that's what, what it does, okay? And now we, can we start computing, okay? Now I've left out a few technical details, okay? Several technical details. Uh, what I've said is not completely correct, but it can be made completely uh, rigorous, so I mean, this I have to cut. So anyway, you can, uh, uh, now it's just a question of solving the questions of motion. They take this form. They have two terms, one in the bulk. This is just the ordinary questions of motion, written in terms of this parameter here, uh, mu, which has the interpretation of chemical potential, okay? And, uh, and then you find that the, this is just a simple system with a cubic equation of motion. And in fact, it boils down to a cubic equation, which is the depressed Cardano equation, okay? Just a cubic equation in mu that you can solve, okay, explicitly. It's the Cardano equation. Then you can plug the solution back into the action. 
and then expand around it, and you will find the energy to all orders and expansion in lambda. So at the leading order, when you expand the solution back in the action, you get this leading term. And actually, we computed these two terms. And let me give you the result. So the first term, the leading term, can be written in the following form. Now, I can take the limit. Now, I'm looking at the leading contribution. Okay, I'm looking at the leading contribution. It means that I'm going, I'm computing the leading classical correction, taking the contribution to the leading powers of n for every, if you want to loop, order. Okay, And I'm neglecting terms that are bound by lambda, by power of the coupling. And I'm precisely letting down all the terms that correspond to quantum effects Okay, in this computation. I'm computing just purely the classical part. Which means that I can really, what I'm really doing, I'm, I'm going to four dimension where the coupling is the critical coupling is proportional to epsilon goes to zero with lambda n fixed. Essentially what, the, you see, when epsilon goes to zero in phi to the fourth theory, the coupling goes to zero. So you have a free theory. But if I can choose configuration with a very large charge, I can preserve some interaction. In other words, uh, the theory is free only if you look at object with few legs. But in the limit of many legs, the theory is interacting also in four dimension. So you have no other pole? No, this is at the fixed point. So there's no other pole. No. And, uh, and, uh, and this is the explicit result for the leading contribution to the dimension of the operator, okay, where x is lambda xn. Now, if you take this formula, which is just a bunch of cubic uh, roots and stuff like that, and you expand it as a power series, this must reproduce the leading contribution of arbitrary loop orders at all orders. Okay? So you can now expand this as a power series, okay? and you find this, 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 and you can go on. Um, okay, you can go on. We have the infinite series. On the other hand, the direct computation of loops only goes up to five or loop orders. If I, if, then it says that there's a seven loop. Here I only show the two loop orders that I was able to compute, okay, that the others are fully professionals. And you can check that the leading power of n matches, okay? In fact, there are also other three terms here, they all match, okay? So this is just to show, this illustrates how loop effects, okay, in some situations are not really loop effects. They are just, especially in this case where, they, where, where there's an additional control parameter, okay? They become large in some effect, in some cases, and when that happens, the, 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 the moral here is, is that it's simply that these loop effects are your, represent your clumsy way of reproducing another trajectory. Okay? If you write, if find the right trajectories, these effects are purely classical. In other words, in, the, in that combination of loops, there is hidden a classical message. Okay? You have all loop, loop, loop. They are all quantum. But there's a information inside that is purely classical. In fact, the existence of these subdominant terms invites the check of the next to leading order, which we did. Okay, we checked the next leading order. These are one computing. I mean, the the, the, the subleading terms are known, so the numbers dimension is being computed. I mean, this is the example of the next to leading order in epsilon. You can find it in several papers. But in fact, there are, we checked up to epsilon to the fifth. It would have been too long a formula. Okay, here I only write epsilon square, but you can check epsilon to the fifth. And again, the subleading terms here are known. And semi-classically, they would correspond to the contribution from the Casimir energy on the cylinder. We computed, and they do match. Okay. So uh, You can also consider another limit. You can consider the limit where the charge becomes very, very large. This is the so-called truly large charge limit. Okay. Uh, in this regime, uh, what happens? The, is that the dimension takes this form. It takes particular powers, crucial particular powers of the charge, four thirds, two thirds, zero, minus two thirds, and so on and so forth. And this is a result that invites an interpretation. Interpretation is the following. Uh, okay, I said this is a superfluid, but it's actually not really a pure superfluid because there are two modes. So a superfluid has the long distance mode, that is phonons, okay, which are the Goldstone bosons of the broken charge. And then it has additional microscopic excitations, okay, that, that have to do the microscopic dynamics. But those are gapped normally. Now here is the same. You have the phonon of the of the of the superfluid, which is just the phase, okay. But there is the radial mode, the radial. So in other words, this is the Goldstone. The fluctuations in the direction of motion is the Goldstone boson. 
but you have fluctuation in the radial direction, and this is gapped, okay? Uh, this is a massive excitation. And its, its mass is of the order of the, of the chemical potential. And in the limit in which you take the charge very large, expectedly, the chemical potential becomes very large, and this excitation becomes very heavy compared to the inverse radius length of, this, of the cylinder. Remember, I'm working on the cylinder, so there is a unit of measure, which is the radius of the cylinder. So saying that the mass is large simply means that the Compton wavelength is, is shorter than the radius of the, of, the, of the sphere that defines the cylinder. And in that case, the mass grows like this. Uh, so in units of the radius, so this is much bigger than the, than the radius, okay? And now you can integrate out this mode. It's heavy, you can integrate it out. And the resulting theory must be a local field theory for purely the hydrodynamic mode, which is the, the sound wave, the, the, the phonon. And now you just have to write this theory as the more general relativistic invariant theory for a phase factor. And it's gonna have, and it has to be conformal invariant. So at the leading order, it has to have dimension force. It has, since given that chi is a phase as dimension zero, this is for derivative decay to the fourth. At the next order, remember, we are on the cylinder, it's a curved space. There can be terms that involve the Ricci curvature. So you have a term with two derivatives and one Ricci. And at the next order, there is a Ricci square. And then you can go on, you can have a Ricci cube divided by decay square. Remember, you're expanding around decay non zero, so decay can also appear in the denominator. And now this expansion here is precisely corresponding to this expansion there. Okay? If you want, this is expansion in curvature. Okay, you can understand this way. And this reproduces results that have been known to derive in the context of CFTs in three dimension in previous paper, in particular, also using the bootstrap. So. <clears throat> uh, last but not least, there are several things I could have said about the, the possible, there are possible, there, there, there are many uh, lessons one can draw, discussion, we've did several, but let me just give you one. Now, if you consider the quantum correction to the leading approximation, they precisely have the form to reproduce, in the case of large charge, the behavior in arbitrary dimension. So it's formula like this, okay? Where this is precisely, is the same, this reproduces the curvature expansion in arbitrary dimension. Remember, the dimension is four minus epsilon. <coughs> and now you can, we have computed this C minus one and C zero at zeroth and first order in epsilon, okay? But in principle, we could compute it, I think it's doable to go to the next order, okay, which is two loops. And now we can, very much like it's done in, in all cases of the epsilon expansion, we can try to compare these guys, I understand it's a stunt, with the result of Monte Carlo simulation in three dimensions. That corresponds flatly to put epsilon equal one and see what happens, okay? And in many cases, this works better than you would expect, perhaps because the expansion parameter is more like epsilon over four than epsilon, okay? Going from four to three is like going, is like saying that n color equal three is already large n, okay? It works. In fact, if you look at the leading term, this is the result of the Monte Carlo simulation. For the, so, so this thing has been derived using the lattice, okay, in three dimensions. Okay, this formula exists in three dimensions with this coefficient computed in three dimensions. So this is the result in three dimensions for the two leading coefficient. <clears throat> and this is what we find. Uh, for the first coefficient, uh, we got very close to the leading order, and the next order we got even closer. So it seems uh, it's not bad. I mean, it's within 20, 30 percent. Uh, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the other one is not as good. Uh, in other words, you have, when, when, when you go from the first to the subleading order, there is an order one cancellation, okay? Uh, but again, the result is somewhat small, so that could be, uh, could, could, be, could be the reason for that. And this motivates to go and see what happens at the order of epsilon squared. In other words, this gives another way to, to test physics uh, in three dimensions. Now, there are many more things that can be said, but let me conclude. So, so the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, I believe, give a rich playground to get a structural insight uh, on the large charge regime in quantum field theory, the regime where lambda n is much bigger than one. Uh, the loop expansion gets, which when you do it diagrammatically breaks down, gets reorganized in semi-classical expansion around a different solution. And this different solution corresponds to a superfluid configuration, in other words. There's a classical, you're computing some correlators, and there is classical physics hiding behind it. The fact that you try to do computation diagrammatically doesn't work is because there is a different type of classical physics behind. 
uh, and, the, and the, the physics of it is just this superfluid. Uh, the consequence of that is that something that I haven't yet discussed, but this is interesting to study, is that, that the spectrum of operators uh, can be mapped in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the uh, superfluid excitations, with the hydrodynamic modes. So in other words, operators in phi to the fourth in this regime can be mapped into phonons, multiphonon states, and states with radial excitations. Uh, in fact, this, this mapping between operators and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and configuration of this fluid and the pres uh, presence of the parameter lambda n has some, some flavor, some, some aspects that have some close similarity, although this is a very toy. In other words, this can be viewed as a toy version of ADS-CFT, okay? In the sense that uh, the parameter lambda n is what you call the Toft coupling. And uh, in, uh, this soft coupling controls, controls the mass, mass of the raw of the, of the radial excitation, the, one, the, 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 the new state that, that makes, in other words, the UV, the, this raw, okay? So it goes like lambda n to some power, okay? It grows with lambda n. Uh, what is the role of, of, of this uh, raw? Raw is the degree of freedom that makes the theory UV complete. Okay, the degree of freedom without the raw, the raw, the raw, the radial excitation. This is I don't know what the, the theory is. This uh, there is a phase, there is the raw uh, degree of freedom. You put them together, you make a renormalizable phi to the fourth theory. Okay, so this is the parameter that controls the UV completion, very much like the Toft coupling. Okay, in ADS CFT, uh, they control the string state. Which control the UV completion of uh, of your uh, of your uh, of your system, okay? And uh, and now you can change this uh, the very much like in uh, in in the case of uh, uh, quantities that have been computed both on the n equal four side and ADS side. Here we can now track the operator spectrum from the region of small lambda n to the region of large lambda n, where, in other words, to go from the region of small lambda n, which is the string limit, okay, where you use Feynman diagram, to the large lambda n limit, which is, if you want, the analog of the supergravity limit. And, uh, and we can track all the operator spectrum using hydrodynamic modes. And in particular, uh, there's gonna be two classes of excitations. There are the excitation by adding powers of derivatives and excitation adding powers of phi dagger phi. Okay, and proper combination of these two, they should correspond to hydrodynamic mode and the radial mode. Okay, so essentially derivatives should roughly correspond to phonons, but not precisely so. And addition of phi dagger phi, they should correspond to the radial mode. And there is, I mean, the, the operator correspondence can be worked out. And uh, 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 you can similarly study uh, the other set of data, the, the uh, high point functions. This is something that can be done. And uh, there are more comments. I can make them to whoever is interested. Of course, it would be nice to get back to the standard model, but that's, there's plenty of time. There's probably a few decades. <laughs> but we'll get to it. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Thank you, Ricardo. So questions for Ricardo? Just a stupid question. Just, okay. just, just one second. A stupid question, but in the saddle point, phi and phi bar are not conjugate, no? No, it's a complex fixed point, for sure. In fact, uh, uh, on the fixed point, the phase is complex, self, right? Yes. Because time is imaginary. So if I have something, see, in, in uh, you can see it right away, in, in Minkowski space, uh, you have a phase rotating, but uh, it goes like e to the i t. But t goes to i tau, so e is to the minus t. So let's say this is complex. Can you explain what do you mean by this phi n1, phi n? Is this higher point correlation function yeah, of yeah. large charge? Like three point function, yes, like three point but function. Phi, let's say phi to n, phi bar n, phi bar n. 
And that is still classical. I would think so. But I would, I would think so. It's hard to find a solution. I would right, think so. It's a very non-trivial. It's a non-trivial thing. Well, I mean, you have to have some ambition. But I think, uh, if you want, it corresponds to computing in the sense the normalization of the two-point function. I only computed the dimension. I would need to compute the normalization. That's more tricky. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Once you are at the conformal point, there is operator state corresponding. Which is what I used, yes. So phi to the n creates some state. And I would say that at large n, there should be a classical configuration, classical solution. Sure, this is the one that we find, yes. Oh, this is the one? Yes. Well, it does not really fight to the end, but it corresponds to some superposition of Very good, ends. very good, very good. That's a, an excellent question. I couldn't talk about this. So <clears throat> when you get to the cylinder, uh, even on the cylinder, inserting phi n at some point, it's non trivial solving the equation. Okay, because you have an insertion of an operator at a point. Yes. It would be nicer if you spread it for instance on the sphere that you have spherical symmetry. Yes, right. that's what you do. Very good. So, uh, okay, let me, I will assume, okay, and then I will check this assumption, that phi n is the operator of lowest dimension with charge n. Uh -huh. Then, no matter how I project on the state of charge n, and here I can choose whatever projection suits me best. When time goes to infinity, I will go to the state of lowest energy with charge n. Mm -hmm. Okay? You, you, do you? Okay. Okay. Now, uh, is phi n the operator of lowest dimension with charge n? Well, certainly yes. In the weakly couple, in the limit of, of uh, weak coupling. Okay. A sufficiently weak coupling. That's true. The a sufficiently small lambda n. That's true. Eh? Sure. Uh, uh, it, surely at small lambda n, that's true. But in principle, you could have level crossing. Now, level crossing corresponds precisely, is like in field theory, when some state becomes light, you have singularities. Now, if that happens, there would be a phase transition in the behavior of the, of the dimension of lowest. This is what I expect, okay? My result is an analytic function because it's just the, a, a solution put back in the cubic equation. I, of course, it has no phase transition. So because of that, and because it matches with the result of perturbative computation of small lambda n, I say this is phi n. But maybe it's... it's but you may have... But that, that, that's based on the, on the assumption that uh, level crossing corresponds to a singularity, which is... Yeah, come on. That's but what happens. That, that right, you, have two, okay. you, you have two de de delta a that goes to zero. Eh? That would be okay. I don't complain. In fact, instead of phi to the n, you could have considered e to the power alpha phi. Maybe it would simplify something, no? Well, that's not an operator of definite charge. Yeah. And then, and then, it, then, you, then you are you're into up to here. Why? Because it does not have a definite charge. I mean, it's like, it's like you... Here, I have a, I, I project, it's easy to project on a state of definite charge. Why do you need to project on, what, what, what is, I don't understand the problem. Let me do the following. Um, uh, so this is the field, okay, uh, is rho e to the i uh, chi, okay, this is my mm -hmm. field. And now I do a path integral with initial condition for rho and chi. So I, I do a path integral in d phi, okay, between some initial time and some final time, and I choose initial conditions for rho i and rho final, let's say fixed, for instance, okay? And then instead for chi, I use a wave function rather than fixing it. I use a wave function, which wave functional, okay, which corresponds to adding here uh, d chi, at the boundary, initial or final, uh, e to the i integral of chi n over the volume over the surface uh, of the sphere. Uh -huh. Okay. Now this is like this is the analog of putting e to the i n phi when you do quantum mechanics m phi. Sorry, and you want to project on the state of angular momentum m. It's exactly the same. Okay. This will project on the state of charge n, and now. In my path integral, we have the action plus this boundary functional. Mm -hmm. And now I can solve this. This is a finite initial time, finite time. 
it's a functional with boundary contribution. I stationarize this, and that gives me that solution. I and see. that, when the, when the times will be very separated, this will give me unavoidably the state of lowest energy, right? I mean, if it overlaps, I mean, it may not overlap, okay? It does overlap, okay? It gives me the state of lowest energy, which is the state of lowest dimension. And because of the analyticity argument I just gave you, I believe this is the phi n. Mm -hmm. But you have to use this thing about, uh, there would be, I mean, when you have level crossing, we know what happens, right? You, when you have level crossing, uh, you have this, you have this, and that, and, and, and um, right? Uh, you, be, before was this one, and then it's this one. You have a phase transition. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have that. Totally okay. analytic. Okay. Okay, so I think we can continue discussions over coffee. So let's talk, thank Ricardo again for this thank very you. nice colloquium. Yeah. Oh. Pedro has an announcement. Yeah, yeah. So for those in the conference or those that like showing up in photos, please stay for uh, the conference group photo that we are going to take uh, right now. So, so. So I get all the coffee and, and 